Veganism is nonviolence. Those are the words I wanted to start with today, because that's what really what this day and all the talks and discussions today really revolve around. The idea that veganism is nonviolence. It's a way of life. It's not just a lifestyle choice. It's not sort of a personal opinion. It's an ethical standpoint. It comes out of some very, very specific philosophical ideas. And that's what I wanted us all to come together and think about and discuss and explore today. And that's what all the speakers, uh, myself included, have been devoted to for a very, very long time. So I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know that some people were not able to come because of weather. And I'm sorry to report that a couple of our speakers were not able to come today. Um, but we're trying to make provisions. One of them, uh, Anna Trotten, is going to be Skyping in today. And we're hoping that the terrific visual artist Sue Coe, who's scheduled for 2 o'clock, may be able to Skype in uh, later today. But uh, she got stranded out on Route 81 for literally most of the day and evening yesterday and finally limped home late last night. And so uh, we're just waiting to hear from her and see what's going to happen. So um, we're going to talk about some connections between theory and practice and how you get from theoretical ideas or meta ethical ideas about the ethical and about uh, the moral status of animals, how we get to a, a robust idea of activism that terminates in the notion of veganism. And in that spirit, uh, I just want to point out that all the food and beverages for all the meals today are strictly vegan. Uh, I've been in hair splitting detail with uh, dining services uh, about this. It's not as easy as you might think. I'm sorry, yeah, it's not easy. There, you know, there are challenges everywhere that you turn, but uh, it seems that we were even able to get uh, bagels that don't have bon char sugar, which is nice. So I want to start by uh, thanking uh, the, the uh, units of the university that funded this day, uh, starting with President Brogman's office. Uh, the president very cheerfully and instantaneously uh, offered up half of the entire budget for the day, the, basically the minute I made a request to him. Uh, so I really want to thank President Brogman. Uh, the Provost's office, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and the Humanities Center at Bucknell. And I just want to point out this building uh, outside the window here that they're almost finished working on. Uh, it's going to get christened as the Hildreth, Hildreth Mizra Hall around the 15th of the month. Um, and that's going to house the Humanities Center, which is also a primary sponsor of this event. And then I'm really pleased to report that of the 14 departments and programs that I contacted, the following 12 were very cheerful in offering support. Uh, art and Art History, English Literary Studies, uh, Sociology Anthropology, Environmental Studies, History, Geography, Religious Studies, Political Science, Comparative Humanities, Classics, Africana Studies, and the Philosophy Department. So there's been very broad and enthusiastic support, and I'm very thankful for it. Um, our speakers today, uh, the ones who are here, uh, actually made it to campus, uh, are Professor Sherry Cole and Michael Dorff, who are law professors at Cornell, um, authors, uh, among other things, of this wonderful book, Beating Hearts, Abortion uh, and Animal Rights, which was published by Columbia University Press. Um, that's a press where Gary Francione and I co-edited a book series called Critical Perspectives on Animals. Um, the other speakers are Gary Francione uh, uh, and his partner, Anna Charlton. Um, they are lawyers and law professors at Rutgers University Law School in Newark, Anna, unfortunately, was not able to come due to a confluence of circumstances, but she's going to be Skyping in uh, in the talk with Gary. Um, they have written a number of books together, one called Eat Like You Care that some of you may have, a new one called Advocate for Animals, an abolitionist vegan handbook uh, that Gary will be happy to talk with you about. And then Gary is a very, very influential uh, theorist of animal rights. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about him in my, in my prepared remarks. Um, he's the author of a very influential book called Animals, Property, and the Law. And he's published a number of other books that have really changed the entire landscape of, of animal rights uh, theory uh, in philosophy and law um, uh, irreversibly. And um, we will talk about this, I'll talk about this a little bit later. 
The last speaker, uh, Sue Ko, is the one who got stranded, and she is a remarkable visual artist who does woodcuts and drawings uh, of slaughterhouse art, things they won't let her photograph. And it's very, very moving, and Sue gives, she's a very, very uh, gripping speaker, very passionate, very committed. Um, she currently has a show at Gallery St. Etienne in New York City through next Saturday, and I went into town, into, into the city to, to see last Saturday. And it's a small but really remarkable show of works uh, by her and by a very famous German artist named Kate Kollwitz, who did um, art revolving around uh, the oppression of human beings, particularly people who are impoverished and exploited in various ways. And there's a very, very interesting link there that I'm going to talk about in my remarks in just a minute about connections uh, that once you see them are quite obvious between the oppression of human beings by human beings and the oppression of non-human animals by human beings. And one of the things that I find remarkable, and I'll conclude my remarks with this morning, is the fact that uh, of all the many, many people uh, who are devoted to uh, exposing and exploring and discussing and critiquing the exploitation of human beings, a surprisingly small proportion of them make the rather obvious connection with the exploitation of non-human animals. And, and that's something that I think needs to be given much greater prominence, and it's one of the things that I'm very, very committed to in my own work, trying to get people to understand that if you really care about exploitation of human beings, you already do, whether you realize it or not, care about the exploitation of non-human animals. So, uh, and then I'll be, of course, giving a talk, and I work on animal rights, teach philosophy here, most of you know me. So um, let me give you an overview of what we're going to do today. Um, the aim is to explore the so-called abolitionist approach to animal rights and its various implications. Uh, what are we now as a society? What's the vegan ideal? What's its ethical basis so that it's not just a matter of personal opinion, but something all people ought to embrace? And what's involved in getting to that ideal? What's involved in, in realizing it? Um, there, are, there are a series of talks today with plenty of time built in for discussions. There are breaks in between the talks so that there's plenty of time for informal as well as formal discussion with the speakers and with each other. Um, I would simply ask that when a presentation is being made, instead of, of uh, interjecting a question or a comment during the presentation, Please wait until the presentation is over. There's lots of time for discussion today. Um, and there will be ample opportunity for everybody to speak. And then we've got a roundtable discussion at the end, but I hope everybody will feel really free to speak. And then there's also lunch uh, with plenty of opportunity, in this room with plenty of opportunity for people to mingle and talk with the speakers informally. And then for anybody who's interested in joining us for dinner, it'll be over in Walls Lounge in the LC, just for logistical reasons. We decided to have it over there. So that's a quick, quick overview of the day. And with that in mind, I wanted to start the day by talking about some of the main themes and issues that I think people should be thinking about when they think about the ideal of abolitionist animal rights and what does the term abolitionist mean. And I want to give this in fairly general terms so that I don't preempt uh, uh, the other speakers. Um, but then again, given that I don't know exactly what they're going to say, this could end up happening anyway. So I'm going to do my best here. Here's where I start uh, uh, on this problem. Um, we have become trained up into and inured to a very, very deep-seated, long-standing set of historical prejudices, according to which human beings are superior to non-human animals. And I like to use the expression non-human animals rather than simply talking about animals, because we, too, after all, are animals. Even though we acknowledge it on the one hand, we like to forget it or try to deny it on the other hand. Um, this sense of superiority has two dimensions. One is the idea that human beings have experiential capacities that make us fundamentally superior to non-human animals. In very, very shorthand terms, the idea that we're smarter, that we have a greater grasp of things, that we have a better understanding of ourselves and where we stand with the world, and that somehow that sense of experiential superiority translates into a kind of moral superiority that entitles human beings to use non-human animals as tools 
instrumentalities, or his resources. Um, there's a long history about this that I've written about, um, and it, it really, for me, goes back to Aristotle. So we're talking about 400 years before the Common Era, and Aristotle is the thinker who, even though he acknowledges that animals can do all sorts of sophisticated things cognitively, in his political, ethical, and psychological writings, the ethics and the politics and uh, on the soul texts and that kind, he sort of puts aside his acknowledgement in the zoological texts where he acknowledges that animals have a lot of forms of intelligence, resourcefulness, ingenuity. This is terms like unasis and phrenesis for non-human animals in the zoological texts. But when it comes to the politics and the ethics, he drills down very, very precisely on a notion that he, that he calls logos. And logos, for the ancient Greeks, in Aristotle's time, refers to the dual capacities of language and rationality. And in fact, for the ancient Greeks, they're absolutely inseparable. And for many people today, depending upon how you slice up the notion of language and the notion of rationality, the way these things play out even today, 2,500 years after Aristotle, is that logos means something like linguistic rationality or, or the rational use of language. Um, either you have all of those capacities or you have none of them. And for Aristotle, this capacity for logos, this capacity uh, for linguistic rationality, facilitates a number of capacities in humans that he does not ever acknowledge in non-human animals. A really interesting one is the capacity for long-term planning or for thinking about time as a whole, thinking about the whole trajectory of your life. This is the kind of capacity that for many people writing today uh, underwrites the capacity for a sense of a biographical sense of self. Uh, and that, for many philosophers, is sort of the high watermark in whether you have full moral status. Can you think of your life in biographical or autobiographical terms? The other thing that for Aristotle is distinctive of logos is the idea that uh, beings possessed of logos are able to engage in abstract contemplation. And for Aristotle, this was contemplation of eternal truths, contemplation of the motions of the stars, contemplation of mathematics, contemplation of objects of thought that don't have any practical application whatsoever. This could even have to do with, say, contemplating God or nous, the notion of reason. And for Aristotle, that is a very sharp dividing line between human beings and animals when it comes to classifying animals in terms of their moral status. For Aristotle, for the Stoic philosophers around his time and, and for the maybe 400 years afterward, all and only those beings who have logos uh, are members of the political community. Um, and what that means, and, and by, by extension, all and only members of beings with logos are members of the moral community. The way the Stoics play this out is they say that nothing that we do to non-human animals can possibly be construed as an injustice. So no matter how much you can torture animals, you can kill them, you can eat them, you can ex exhibit complete and utter disregard for them, and it wouldn't matter morally. Or politically, because they're not part of the community of beings that are tied together by this capacity for the logos. Um, and according to the Stoics, animals don't really even have things like desires and beliefs because they don't have concepts, they don't have language. And for the Stoics, things like beliefs and desires are linguistically structured, or predictively structured. So you've got this really sharp exclusion of animals from the moral and political community, starting with Aristotle. And there's a long history of thinking through uh, not only the Greeks and the Romans, but through the Christian tradition, through modern philosophy, even in secular philosophy. Overwhelmingly, you have animals excluded from the moral community on the grounds that they don't possess the capacities or the kinds of intelligence that human beings possess. Um, just to repeat the core idea for Aristotle, what makes us most godlike, what makes us most like, like divine beings, is the fact that only human beings among created beings share this capacity with the gods for contemplation, for contemplative ability. And what I want to suggest is, even in those moments when we sort of toss Aristotle aside for having such long-headed ideas about whether women can be citizens or how democracy really should be structured, 
we still adhere to that basic prejudice. At least many people in our society, and the sort of resounding base note is there's something about non-human animals that makes them fundamentally inferior to human beings. And whether we realize it or not, we share something in common with the same Aristotle whom we might tend to criticize for certain views he has about political life. So I'll spare you the history, but it's, I've written about it, and we can talk about it during question and answer or whenever you like. Uh, those of you who've taken the animal uh, ethics course with me, we've been through some of that history together. So that's the first point, that what we're starting from is a widespread, deep-seated historical prejudice about the relative moral status of humans and non-human animals. The second point is that the idea of abolitionism, which is the core idea for the discussions today, abolitionism is a position that challenges this traditional prejudice of human superiority and leads to a very practical conclusion, namely that we need to cease, we need to suspend or abandon, uh, dis, uh, disavow all forms of animal use for food, clothing, labor, entertainment, experimentation, whatever it might be. And my own sort of uh, uh, shorthand for this, my working principle in my own life is if I wouldn't do it to a human being, I think there's a prima facie reason not to do it to a non-human animal. And prima facie simply means maybe you could tell a story about why it actually is important to do it to a non-human animal. But just as in the case of human beings, you want to inflict violence. You've got to have a very, very firm and good and clear reason to do it. We tend to uh, respect that, that rule or that principle with regard to humans much more than we do in the case of non-human animals, especially given the the kind, extent, and scale of violence that we inflict on non-human animals every day, and it's happening right now. So I'll talk a little more about abolitionism in a short while. The traditional assumption, to go back to it, is that because animals lack logos, what animals, non-human animals are, is, this is an expression that I was surprised to learn last semester. A lot of my students aren't familiar with, but people of my age, my generation, are familiar with this. People talk about dumb animals. Have you ever heard this expression? And what it means is, people think of it in an offhand way that a dumb animal is a stupid animal. But the sort of etymology of this, or the way this kind of historically arose was, People who were dumb in the sense of lacking speech were considered to be stupid, right? Because the idea is if you're linguistic, if you're fully linguistic, you're fully intelligent, and if you have any kind of limits on your linguistic ability, like the inability to form speech, there must be something wrong or deficient about you. And because animals don't speak, at least on the traditional view, they don't speak in ways that human beings would look at and say, yeah, that's absolutely speech. Because and the animals speak to us all the time. They just don't speak to us in our language. But the idea is that animals are dumb animals. They're stupid. And that stupidity, on the traditional view, takes these sorts of forms. Non-human animals don't have a sense of self. They don't have self-awareness. They don't have a sense of time or history, as I mentioned before. That non-human animals can't have an overarching life project, that they don't have any grasp or conscious relation to death, that non-human animals don't have real emotions, such as the stoic view that I presented a few minutes ago. This is a very common one today, that non-human animals don't have a capacity for long-term planning. Uh, and the summary idea that they have no real rationality. No real rationality. And that begs a lot of questions like what is rationality? And does rationality have to take the form of being able to structure sentences in subject predicate form? Does it mean you have to be able to do geometry? And where does that leave me? Because I can't do geometry. Right? Um, these, this is a kind of exploration of the traditional assumptions. And some of the uh, 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 talks that are going to be given today are going to look further into this. Now, Here's something, a kind of meta consideration about these traditional assumptions that animals lack a sense of self, that they lack language, they lack rationality, they can't plan. The traditional view is to assume that animals lack these abilities 
unless somebody such as me or an animal behavior researcher can prove that they do possess those capacities. That seems to be implicitly the default position, that unless and until it can be demonstrated authoritatively that non-human animals possess these capacities, we must proceed on the assumption that they categorically lack them. Rather than doing something that might be arguably more commonsensical, which is to say, why not assume that they do possess these capacities unless and until somebody can prove that they lack them, right? Um, there's two reasons for this. Number one, it turns out to be very, very tricky, given the way that science defines standards of proof, to give a definitive proof that another being, other than yourself, has a mind or self-awareness or thoughts or deliberation or anything like that. How do you actually prove that another being possesses that? Even in the case of humans, many times the default is to go to the idea of analogy. Well, this other being behaves like me. I have these capacities, therefore I can conclude that this other being has them. But there are two considerations that are worth uh, uh, thinking about when asking which way the presumption should run. Should, should the presumption be that they do have the capacities until we prove that they don't, or should we assume that they don't have until we prove that they do? And the two considerations are evolutionary continuity between human beings and non-human animals. And the other one is physiological similarity. Um, there are a lot of physical systems in human beings that make things like rationality possible that we share with a great many non-human animals. Um, and that has implications that when I, when I get to a brief overview of uh, Gary Francione's uh, thinking, I'll state in very, very brief terms. Um, so, there's a traditional prejudice. It's widespread. It's deep-seated. It operates at the level beneath consciousness, and it doesn't even involve any kind of thought. We just automatically engage in certain ways of assuming things, thinking about things, and valuing things. And many of these acts of valuing are absolutely transparent to us. We don't even think that we're about uh, the fact that we're projecting traditional value hierarchies or human beings are superior and non-human animals are not superior or, or inferior. Now, the third or fourth point now is there are different ways in which philosophers tend to respond to the claim that there's actually a continuity between human beings and non-human animals. And I want to talk very briefly about what I take to be sort of the holy trinity of contemporary thinkers about animal rights or the moral status of animals. That's Peter Singer, Tom Reagan, Gary Francione. Um, we're lucky to have uh, one of these deities in the room today. Um, so Peter Singer is a utilitarian thinker, very famous. He's a professor at, uh, at Princeton. And like, like all utilitarians, he focuses on capacities to experience pleasure or pain. Uh, and uh, uh, and sort of it advocates uh, performing a sort of calculus, right? It, it lends itself very easily to economic thinking, that uh, the outcomes that are best, the choices that are the best, are the ones that maximize pleasure and minimize pain, or that maximize overall happiness or welfare for the whole group uh, taken as, uh, as an entirety, as, as a unit. Um, Peter Singer has a slight wrinkle in that. He talks about the satisfaction of preferences as opposed to just straight up pleasure and pain. And those beings that can have their preferences satisfied the most, that's the way that you want to sort of orient your utilitarian calculus. Um, one advantage of a utilitarian approach is that it does acknowledge that what, what your criterion for inclusion in the moral community should be is not just whether you're rational, but whether you're sentient. And sentient means you can experience states of pleasure and pain. You have sensations. You can suffer. You can have enjoyment. Right? Jeremy Bentham did this uh, uh, in 1789 in the introduction of the principles and laws and legislation. John Stuart Mill repeats it in Utilitarianism, which is around 1850. And Singer um, sort of plays out this idea. But there's a very interesting fact, and that is that even though utilitarians let animals into the sphere of moral cons morally considerable beings, 
they still assert a hierarchy. And it's very, very clearly seen in Bentham in a way that I think Gary might talk about later. It's certainly clear in Mill, because Mill is the one who very, very famously says it's better to be uh, Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. And what he means by that is even the unhappiest person is much better off in utilitarian terms than the happiest non-human animal. And the reason that Mill gives is because there is a hierarchy of types of satisfactions or pleasures that you can experience. The pig, according to Mill, can experience only lower, so supposedly putatively lower satisfactions. Um, at the risk of using an inappropriate term in an academic context, I call these rooting around in shit kinds of pleasures. Because that's what we imagine pigs to do. They just root around in muck. They enjoy sexual pleasure. They enjoy gustatory pleasure. They enjoy the pleasure of lying in the sun and feeling the warmth. And human beings are able to do that, according to Mill, but they're also able to enjoy supposedly higher pleasures, intellectual, social, and moral pleasures. Right? So suddenly now we've got a view according to which if you can compose music, or if you can appreciate music, if you can read great literature, if you can do philosophy, that somehow makes you count more in the moral calculus than a being that can't do any of those things. And what somebody like Mill, like Mill doesn't do, and something that what somebody like Singer doesn't do, is ask the question: What about human beings who are very limited in their capacities for correct satisfaction? Because there are also human beings. Some of them are children. Some of them are adults with various developmental disabilities who have very, very severe limitations on the kinds of enjoyments that they can have. And yet, what people like Singer tend to do is just throw all human beings. Uh, into the same group and say they're superior to all non-human animals without even having to ask questions like, does Coco the gorilla have higher preference satisfaction? Because she's the gorilla that knows very, very large vocabulary of sign language and uses language in innovative ways. So, bottom line for Singer is this. You have to be self-aware. It's one of those criteria I pointed to before. You have to be self-aware in order to have the highest kind of moral status in this moral community. And he says, you know, some non-human animals may be self-aware, but no non-human animal is nearly as self-aware as a human being. Therefore, you always prefer the human being to the non-human animal in cases of, of conflict, maybe even in cases where there's no conflict. That's a really quick overview of Peter Singer. And, and the funny thing is he's thought of as the father of the animal rights movement, but utilitarians reject the whole idea of rights, so it's kind of ironic that he's thought of it that way. The, uh, the second person in this in this sort of trinity is Tom Reagan, um, who uh, pioneered a kind of Kantian style or Kant-inspired approach, deontological approach to, to the moral status of non-human animals, in which he argued that certain kinds of beings have inherent moral worth, this Kantian idea, but where Kant limited that to moral agents. Reagan came up with this very resourceful idea of what he called moral patience. Moral agents are ones who can act and take responsibility and be held responsible for their choices. Moral patients are beings modeled on uh, human beings with developmental disabilities or, or human children who don't either don't have or don't yet have those capacities, but still want to be recognized to have some kind of inherent moral worth. And Reagan said, if it's going to apply to human beings with developmental disabilities or to human children, it ought to apply, so to speak, mutatis mutandis to non-human animals. And a whole bunch of non-human animals were now part of, of Reagan's ideal of the moral community. Um, and he said that his criterion was what he called subjects of life. If you're a subject of life, if you have a whole bunch of capacities that include memory and thinking about the future, and, and ultimately the core uh, concept is psychophysical identity over time. That's an interesting concept, and it's a rich, kind of conceptually laden one. The psychophysical identity over time, which means I can think of myself in something resembling biographical terms, I have a sense of myself before, now, and later, then I'm a subject of a life and I have this inherent moral work. Turns out that even Reagan uh, asserts a kind of hierarchy because he says if you've got a lifeboat, an emergency scenario, and you've got to privilege somebody over somebody, he has reasons that I won't go into now in the interest of time why he says you always privilege the human being. 
And in the end, he says in the lifeboat case, if it, even if you had to sacrifice a million dogs to save one human being, this is literally what he says in, in uh, the case for animal rights in 1983, even if you had to sacrifice a million dogs to save one human life, that would make sense more. Um, okay, then we come to Gary Francione. Uh, for whom, and, and he's not alone in this room in believing this, but there's something a little bit problematic about that kind of reasoning. Because the logical extension, as I've argued in my own work, Reagan's idea is if you're going to sacrifice a million non-human animals, why not sacrifice everything in nature other than a human being just to save one human? You could kill every animal on Earth. Right? I mean, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization reports, I think it was the number up to 60 billion land animals a year now, 60 billion land animals per year worldwide are killed for human consumption. That's every year. And I, in my own research, what I discovered was that's more that, that's just land animals. That doesn't count fish or other sea creatures. And Jonathan Balcom recently wrote a book about fish in which he said, if you count fish and sea creatures, it's probably over a trillion a year. But let's just think about the 60 billion number. According to uh, one German philosopher whose book I read about two years ago, that's as many non-human animals killed for human consumption, land animals, in a year and a half is the total number of human beings ever to have existed on Earth. It's a staggering number, right? And, and, and if, if we are suspicious of Reagan's suggestion late in his life that the lifeboat example was just an, an, kind of a, an exceptional case and it wasn't exemplary of his theory. If we're suspicious of that, then we have to worry about whether that kind of approach is really adequate. That's what takes me to Gary Francione's work, which I think is really a game changer, much more so even than the move to utilitarianism, which brought animals into the moral community in the first place. Because if you bring animals into the moral community and it has no real purchase on our moral thinking, what is the cash value of bringing them into the moral community? What, what Gary has done is he's sort of clarified and sort of what I, what I think of as correcting uh, Reagan's work. And the way Gary has presented this in his own writings is this. Uh, if you're sentient, if you're capable of suffering, if you're capable of pleasure and pain, and for me, those capacities, sentience, is tied irretrievably to just being having subjective states of awareness. Anybody who's lived with companion animals, who've been muck around animals much at all, knows that many, many animals are sentient. They have subjective lives that matter to them. Even if they can't spell out in theoretical or detached terms how their lives matter, if you're sentient, Gary says, that is both necessary and sufficient for full inclusion in the moral community, and there is no room for making hierarchical distinctions based on the degree of your capacities or how similar a non-human animal's cognitive abilities are to those of the human being. That, the idea that sentience is sufficient for moral status, gives rise to a right to life, that other thinkers haven't acknowledged in non-human animals. It has implications for duties that we have to respect the freedom and prerogatives of non-human animals to live their lives without interference from human beings. Uh, it's a rejection of any kind of hierarchy in moral status. Uh, and it, it terminates in a pragmatic imperative of ceasing to use non-human animals as sources uh, uh, for the satisfaction of human desires and needs. That's what the abolitionist ideal really is. The abolition, rather than really the regulation, of uh, these practices involving the use of non-human animals. And one of the ideas you're going to be hearing about today is how, how abolitionism is distinct from a, a, a prevailing view called welfareism. Welfareism is the view that, look, it's actually okay to experiment on animals. Uh, it's okay to use them in entertainment, in circuses and zoos and so forth. It's okay to eat them uh, uh, and so forth, have them as pets, as long as you treat them well while you perform these practices. That's, so the idea is what you want to do is promote animal welfare. Right. And that's the predominant orientation of our society. Even when people care about animals, they want to get cage-free eggs or whatever it might be, that's a classic example of animal welfareism. 
the idea that it's okay to take the eggs as long as you treat the, the chickens well. Whether chickens are really treated well when they're supposedly cage-free is another story entirely, because when you look into the United States Department of Agriculture regulations, if you, when you buy free-range products, free-range just means must have access to daylight. It doesn't mean you ever actually experience any daylight. It means there could be a little door open at the end of the airplane hangar, and you know, a thousand feet away, you, you're, you're in prox some kind of distant proximity to it, you can be classified as free range. So the abolitionist perspective is one that says, look, it's not enough just to treat the animals better on their way to the slaughterhouse. Uh, you've got to just stop these practices altogether. It goes back to my working principle, which is, look, if you wouldn't confine and kill human beings, if you wouldn't experiment on human beings, why on earth would you rush to do it to a non-human animal? especially given how vulnerable, defenseless non-human animals are in the face of human beings. So that's the abolitionist perspective, and that's what I think all the speakers involved in, in today's um, uh, conference are very much devoted to, an abolitionist perspective, uh, not just a welfareist one. There's an ideal of justice at the core of this. Justice as the ideal of nonviolence. And I just, I want to wrap up in the next five minutes or so, I want to talk with you just a little bit about philosophical views about justice, because there are as many views and conceptions of justice as there are people writing about it. I always go back to Hesiod, a contemporary of Homer. So this is about seven or eight centuries before the Common Era, back in the time of, of, of epic Greece, prior to uh, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And he said in a text called The Works and Days talks about how uh, this is called the five ages of man. You see this in Ovid's Metamorphoses as well. It's the idea that we were born, and it sort of parallels the story of the fall from grace uh, in the book of Genesis. We started out born into a golden age. Everything was, as philosophers say, copacetic. Everybody was nice to everybody. Humans and animals were friendly with each other. Uh, the, the scant evidence that we get in thinkers like he said in Ovid and in the book of Genesis is that people had a vegetarian diet. And then slowly there was a devolution, a kind of fall through different, you know, went to silver and went to, went to bronze and iron and so forth. And what ends up happening is people devolved into mutual conflict and warfare. And Zeus has to come to earth at some point, he said, tells us and deliver the law of justice, decay, to human beings, which is one that says you must act peaceably toward one another. It's a, it's a law prescribing peaceful interrelationships among human beings. And he see it says something very, very interesting that, like Aristotle, ends up being definitive for the entire subsequent history of thinking in the West about human, non-human animal relations. He says animals are not included in this agreement or in this, in this bond of mutual peace, mutual non-harm, because animals cannot listen to justice. Those are the words that he said uses. So uh, 300 years before, or 400 years before Aristotle, he anticipates the Logos criterion and proclaims that non-human animals can't be part of the justice bond. They can't be beneficiaries uh, 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 of, of justice simply because they don't have language. They can't listen to the law. They can't comprehend the law, right? Um, Epicurus in antiquity is also very, very well known for sort of uh, metamorphosing or changing this Hesiod idea of justice into a, an explicitly contractual relationship between human beings, where justice is understood as contractual uh, bargain for agreements entailing mutual non-harm. Um, and, and Epicurus, for the same reason, excludes non-human animals because non-human animals can't be signatories to contracts. So it's all what I would call in my own work, and it's a word that, that Gary will forgive me for using now and then, it's a very anthropocentric orientation. Um, the title of my first book on animals is Anthropocentrism and Its Discontents. And anthropocentric simply means human-centered. But it means human-centered in multiple ways. It means not only human-centered in the sense that it's from our own experience that we have to reach out to the world and try to understand it and relate it back to our own experience. It's not just that sort of phenomenologically informed idea. 
Anthropocentrism at its root is a moral claim, a moral presupposition that human beings are the center of things, in the sense in which human beings are considered to be the center of things uh, in Scripture, that the earth is the fixed center of things, not only in a physical sense, but in a moral sense. Um, what Epicurus tells us, what Hesiod tells us, what subsequent, even contemporary moral and political thinkers like John Rawls tell us, is all deeply anthropocentric thinking, because Rawls, too, repeats this old kind of idea that says animals are excluded from the political community because they cannot actually participate in the political process. And I would assume this is true for Habermas as well, even though I don't remember him talking explicitly about non-human animals. Now, the last thing I'll say is, you know, Rawls has a get-out-of-jail-free card, as one of my colleagues would put it, Rawls says, look, I'm not saying that animals have no moral status. I'm simply saying that in order, he says this in political liberalism and in the theory of justice, he says, in order to figure out what the moral status of animals is, we would need a theory of nature and man's place within it. That's almost a verbatim quotation. So he says, look, I'm just talking about the political. I'm just talking about human-human relations. And that all sounds innocuous as far as it goes, but step back and think about the anthropocentric sort of prejudice in that. He starts in advance, Rawls does, from the presupposition that the way to understand justice is in human-human terms. That it doesn't even make sense to consider animals as beneficiaries of justice. And for my own thinking, that is the core idea when someone says veganism is non-violence. Right? It goes back to that ideal in Hesiod, that ideal in Epicurus, that what justice is about is the acknowledgement that we should be peaceable toward one another. We should live in a community that practices non-violence, non-harm. And the ideal of justice that I embrace and that the other speakers involved in today's conference embrace, I'm going to guess that a lot of you came here because you embrace is the idea that if you really believe in non-violence, it has to extend beyond human relations. It has to extend to all beings that can be harmed in their subjective lives and in their attempts to just live out a life that is every bit as important to them as our lives are to us, even though they may not be able to conceptualize or talk to us about their lives in language that we would consider to be definitive proof that they have subjective awareness of lives that they care about. And that, for me, is what veganism is about, and that's what abolitionism is about. So those are my introductory remarks. I hope that they frame things okay for the subsequent talks today. And what I want to do is, we've got, a, we've got plenty of time today um, just to open this up for questions, reflections, discussion, challenge, anything that you want to talk about. We've got at least 15, 20 minutes to do this. Okay? Sherry. Um, yes, well, thanks for... Your this is Sherry Cole, one of the speakers today. Hi. Um, so I was thinking about what you said about how the criteria that various thinkers have announced for moral consideration exclude a lot of human beings because a lot of humans don't have speech and so on. And so I wonder what you think about this. I haven't really thought about it that much, but do you think it's easier now to advocate for animals now that we have sort of recognized the equality of humans who have mental and physical disabilities because we're sort of we're sort of saying that these various criteria are, are wrong and arbitrary, um, or do you think that part of their uplift has consisted in pushing down animals, and so sort of telling people, you are a human, you too are a human, and that that has, in some ways, made explicit the degradation of animals in a way that wasn't maybe necessary before, but then it wasn't as much part of things. That's a really interesting question, and it's a sociological one, so of course as a philosopher I have no clue, but it strikes me as you, as you play out these two possibilities that I wonder if it's a little of both, that it depends on who we're talking about, because you know we're not all of one mind, and society isn't sort of unified in the way it thinks about things, but thinking about someone like this, this uh, philosopher Peter Carruthers, who has this idea that the reason that we include, in fact, maybe the only reason we include uh, people with cognitive disabilities and children in the moral community as, as sort of fully, uh, 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 as having full moral status is, uh, is on virtue ethics grounds. You know, that sort of indirect duties kind of idea that, well, look, if we, if we 
if we're nasty to or experiment on, say, people with cognitive disorders, um, it makes us more likely to be nasty to people who don't have this disorder, something like that. That's the kind of reasoning that Carruthers gives for why if, if grandma, and he gives this example in one of his books, if grandma falls dead on the floor in the kitchen, why you shouldn't just kick or otherwise desecrate or maybe even cook her and eat her. Whereas if you found a dead animal, there'd be nothing wrong with it. And it, it, it's, a, it's a genuine, a sort of generally virtue ethics kind of idea according to which we would have creepy people in our society if they were people who were indifferent to grandma's dead body even though it's dead and she can't be harmed anymore, it's somehow a harm to our humanity by, by disregarding or not treating it with a certain kind of dignity. Um, that, for me, is not a real robust acknowledgement that people with cognitive disabilities should be considered to have full moral status. It's almost like getting them in through the back door or something like that. Um, what is your own thinking about that? I, I agree with you that it might be it might be easier in some ways. And I think as a matter of intellectual argumentation, it's easier because you have somebody making an argument <clears throat> that only humans count because they can communicate and then you can respond and say, well, actually, some humans cannot communicate and yet we extend rights to them. And they can't go, and, and you know, they're sort of stuck because they at least nominally have to acknowledge that those human beings are more have moral status, uh, whereas in the past you could just say, well, they don't count either. Or you could have this kind of, well, we'll let them in in the back door the way that, you know, sometimes you let people bring their kids into a theater when they actually don't belong there. Um, but at the same time, maybe um, in the past, it wasn't as threatening to talk about animals having entitlements because it wasn't, it seems like it's so much part of I mean, I see that I'm, I'm on the admissions committee of the law school of Cornell, and I see these where people will write, you know, I know that I'm a human being, you know, for people who have been oppressed. And, it, and it's like that seems to be part of people's pride in being a member of the species. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that makes it challenging um, to yeah. talk about animal rights because are you saying that I'm like an animal? Or are you saying that? I'm not superior. I just got here. Part of being what I where I am, I, I get to be superior to animals. Right. It's you know it's really interesting because you as you as you said that last set of remarks, it made me think about the fact that now I just full disclosure, those of you who don't know me, I'm a very cynical person. So <laughs> become clearer and clearer as the day goes on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> try to be optimistic, try to stay in my happy place, as Paula and I like to say, but I tend to be pretty cynical. And one of the things I've been preoccupied with recently is the fact that human beings love to sort of puff up their plumage and proclaim their superiority and talk about how they have moral theories and how they have political theories and they have ideals of justice. When you think about how seldom we actually live up to those ideals, you know, the ideals themselves start to look a little bit hollow. And, you know, one of the things I've taken to doing in, in conferences, especially in more adversarial uh, context where people are challenging me on this kind of moral equity or equality between human beings, uh, moral equivalence between human beings and non-human animals, is to say, look, um, here's the calling card for human superiority. Um, we have almost fished the seas dry. Um, we have polluted the waterways. I read just the other day that there's going to be more plastic than, than sea creatures in the sea within some calculable number of years. Um, we have screwed up the ozone layer. We have uh, polluted the air. Um, uh, we have uh, poisoned the soil. Um, we have, uh, and, and with all due respect to Stephen Pinker, who thinks we're so much more civilized and peaceable now, um, I, 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 I don't find an enormous amount of tangible evidence for that. So that when I think about the claim that human beings are superior, it makes me less inclined to, to sort of shout proudly, I'm a human being, you know. It makes me want to say, I'm an animal, you know, because try to find a non-human animal uh, that has done as much violence to itself, to its neighbors, or to the environment as human beings, and you're just not going to find one. Um, so, uh, and, and, and yet, at the same time, the prejudice I started by talking about is, 
people somehow having difficulty seeing that. And when they see it, they see that there's violence over there. When they see that there's pollution over there, and they think that by um, uh, feeling bad about it, they're doing what they need to do about it, and that somehow they're not an actual participant in it or a reinforcer of it. Um, and, and it leaves me actually in a way kind of at a loss for how to answer the initial question that you ask. Are we, are, you know, is it easier to argue on behalf of animals now? Is it harder to argue on behalf of animals? And one of the layers of this, I think Gary is going to probably talk about, and I think you two are going to talk about later today as well, which is what's the impact of animal welfare measures on the psychology of human beings who purport to care about animals? Is it beneficial for non human animals that we have these welfare measures? Is it ultimately, could it be harmful? You know, how could giving um, uh, laying hands you know, space outside of cages, how could that be bad? Or how could, you know, Proposition 2 that was passed in California about eight or nine years ago that gives, you know, brooding hands more room to live in, how could that possibly be bad? And it turns out that there's a surprising answer. So, Mike. Uh, so I have a question about where you ended with roles. Uh, so roles, um, right, it's a theory of Justice, there's a theory of political justice, right? Well, it wants us to bracket our comprehensive moral views. Right. So I wonder whether there's a way to make one, one, so here's how I understand your point, right? And, I want, and then I have a puzzle about it, which is next to our, our discussion. Yeah. Um, that uh, Rawlsianism is at most welfareist because um, it will relegate views about how our, our moral duties to animals to comprehensive moral views rather than moral views that are within justice. Um, and so, and the way that will cash out is that behind the veil of ignorance, you can imagine yourself as a philosophy professor or a plumber, but not as a dog. Right, exactly, not as a dog. Um, and so, but here's the puzzle for me, right, which is uh, so, suppose we were to amend laws, do for laws what? Gary does for Tom Reagan, for example, let's make it consistent with us, our view. Um, and so the, the puzzle is behind the veil of ignorance, is it possible that I'm a dairy cow or an egg laying hen? And if our view is in the sort of abolitionist future, those beings don't exist, um, I'm not sure how that. How, how you put it out. And that comes in, that, that, as you see, that'll tie into what we have to say about, about it, of, of being, you know, how we ought to think about existence itself. Yeah, let's let that be a puzzle. I just want to recapitulate what Mike said. Um, they're going to talk, uh, Mike and Sherry are going to talk about things related to this this afternoon. So just so everybody's on the same page. Um, the comprehensive view idea in Rawls is just this. Um, Rawls' idea, some of you know this, some of you don't. Rawls has this idea that. If, when you want to form, formulate rules for a political community, for a, uh, a society, a civil society, you want to have rules that are as impartial as possible. And that's what this veil of ignorance idea is about. I don't want to explain. But you're supposed to I'll simply say this about it. You want to sort of pick the rules that, if you didn't know whether you were male or female or black or white or whatever, you, you would formulate rules that have general validity and applicability and impartiality because you don't know what you, you know, you don't want to have rules that say that white people are superior to black people or have rights that blacks don't have because what if you wind up being black? That's the idea of the veil of ignorance. The comprehensive view idea is this. Any kinds of, of commitments that people in the society have that can't be sort of regulated through those impartial rules, which are things like, you know, everybody has the right to own property, or nobody does. It's not like only certain people have the right to own property. When it comes to things like whether you're going to practice a religion, and if so, which religion you're going to practice, or whether you think that animals have rights or not, this stuff, the comprehensive use stuff is all, that's all in the private sphere, not in the public sphere. And that's not something that the laws are entitled to regulate, because now you're interfering with people's freedoms in a way that it entails things like uh, a violation of the church, the separation of church and state type principle. That's the comprehensive view. And the idea that, that Mike was just putting, uh, putting forward is, according to Rawls, 
what you think about the moral status of animals is all a comprehensive view thing. It's all just part of your private, personal thing between you and your guy. The other thing that Mike was talking about, which is what the topic of Mike and Sherry's talk is, is going to deal with, is this. One of the tenets of abolitionism that people find the hardest to accept at an intuitive level is that all domestication would have to cease. Because it views domestication as violence against non-human animals. Um, Gary Soka, former president of Bucknell, um, raises sheep that he slaughters for human consumption. And he and I have had a, a wonderful ongoing argument about this over the last 15 or 20 years about whether that's okay or not. And I actually invited him to come to my animal ethics class last term, and a couple of you were there to hear him speak and defend the idea. Um, for him, for somebody like, like Gary Soika, the idea that his sheep wouldn't exist is anathema, because he thinks it's, it's clear on its face that the fact that those sheep wouldn't exist unless he raised them for slaughter is itself a justification of their existence. It's better for them to exist and be slaughtered as humanely as you can get them slaughtered than for them not to exist at all. And there's a very famous uh, British thinker named Gary, uh, Gary I'm sorry, um, Richard Sarabji, um, who wrote, um, I think it's called Animal Rights and Human Morals, something like that. It's a book about uh, the history of Western philosophy and animal rights. And he raises the question in there, if you had a, a, a race of human beings who can only exist as slaves, would it make sense, would it be better for them to exist as slaves than for them not to exist at all? And it's a very, very pregnant example uh, or question, and it's one that's worth sort of, sort of thinking about. So when Mike, I just want to finish rounding up the idea, Carl. What Mike is getting at is this. It's hard to talk about of what, how you ne negotiate the idea of being a, a cow or a dog, say, behind the veil of ignorance, if, according to the abolitionist ideal, there wouldn't necessarily be any cows or dogs anywhere um, in an abolitionist uh, uh, world, right? And then there's a lot of questions that we can talk about, about in what sense, uh, 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 whether and in what sense the domestication is violence for the of animals. But I would just say, just as a really simple way to think about it, think about a, a kind of a wild or feral or outside dog. I've known people who have outside dogs, and they guard dogs. They're very, very different than the lap dogs who live in the house. Right. Carl, what were you going to say? Yeah, my question was going to touch on what you said. I mean, we have um, so many species, so many types of animals that are so selectively bred that if animals would have it tomorrow, they would quickly die out without getting into What do we do with all these animals? Yeah, what do we do with them? So my own answer is very simple, which is, Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've taught for 30 years, and there are certain problems you have with students. <laughs> um, what we do is, and, and, I, and this is an interesting one, because you know, there's no plain or simple, completely unproblematic solution to the problem of domestication. Because you have to interfere with the freedom of the domesticated animals who already exist by preventing them from reproducing. And then what you do is you steward them at the best way that you can through the rest of their lives. And then when they're gone, there are no more domesticated animals. That would be a huge undertaking. It would be an enormous undertaking. I mean, there's no sight. Right, but we are starting to is it any more, is it more enormous or less enormous than continuing to breed them, bring them into existence, slaughter them, and eat them? That for me is the question, because you basically do this with whatever extant group of domesticated animals are on the earth right now. I mean, look, if it's 60 billion a year, that means it, it ends up being, you know, it's 600 billion in 10 years. Right, so you're effectively having this problem you have to deal with. With, with many fewer non-human animals. And then the other question is, is the fact that it would be logistically difficult and possibly extremely expensive to do it a reason not to do it? And the abolitionist view, the idea that animals have inherent worth is the idea that there are certain things you should never do to non-human animals. So it would, and then I know Carl is not pushing in this direction, 
I'm simply saying the logical alternative would be to say, well, let's not stop domestication then. And then what we're doing is we're infringing on the rights of just literally countless non-human animals with inherent moral worth for the indefinite future. But I think it's clearly a logistical problem, Gary. Yeah, so we wouldn't mean hypo the hypothetical. It assumes that we all wake up tomorrow morning and we're all vegans. And so now what do we do about the animals? Well, first of all, if that happened, um, we would be very different beings. Um, it would be a very different world. Donald Trump would probably not be president. <laughs> um, uh, but but um, I think, you know, it's not going to happen. What will happen is that people become more convinced uh, that it will be a matter of justice and honor. And just the animal, the demands of the family. And that's, that, that's how it will transition. And it's not going to be the case that you have to say. Since you go down what the hell do you do with these animals? I mean, frankly, I would love I, I think we would be in a much better world if tomorrow morning we all got up and said, violence is just such a horrible idea, and our commitment to nonviolence means that we are no longer going to speak about nonviolence while we shovel the corpses and crimes of animals into our mouth. Um, and we start behaving more consistently. Um, it would be great. I think we would have a much better world. I mean, I really do. But that ain't going to happen. And the way it will happen. Well, just uh, the just point is, a lot of these animals that exist today will no longer be gone, they'll be extinct. So what? Okay. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's do uh, one more comment or question, and then just in the interest of time, um, Gary and Anna will be speaking. Anna, as I said before, will be speaking remotely. That will take us up to 12. Now we've got lunchtime, and it's all in here, so we can continue the discussion informally as well. So please, go ahead. <clears throat> we talk about how the abolitionist approach views a life of peace. Um, so, a theory of nonviolence is an ideal, right? A really yeah. non ideal world. Of course, Gary Francio argues that we create these um, seeming situa situations of conflict yeah. artificially. And so, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a genuine case of conflict is the idea. From the abolitionist approach, that there is no real fact of the matter, I mean, except from a subjective, interesting point of view, right. as if you're choosing between your dog and your child. Yeah, now I'm not going to speak for Gary, but my best sense of what, in terms of what he's written, and in terms of my own thinking about abolitionism, is that, that is exactly right. Uh, Gary says in a brilliant book called Introduction to Animal Rights, Your Child and the Dog. Um, he says that you know morality doesn't have a kind of mathematical precision, the kind of precision we might want it to have. And I take from that, and he also says in there that if you were to decide in a burning house scenario, which is just like a lifeboat, you can only save your child or you can save your dog, a dreadful eventuality that A, most of us will never face, because most cases are not burning house cases or lifeboat cases. We treat them all as if they are, and therefore privilege ourselves. But the fact is, it's very, very rare, and I like to think that practically no one in this room will ever actually face one. That's the starting point. The next thing is, you ever find yourself in a situation like that? Like people have asked me in class or in talks before, if it was Pindar, a beloved cat who died a little under a year ago, or my, my, my dear wife Paula, which one would you say? I, I just really say, well, you know, most of us are never going to face that kind of a situation. So, you know, ask me when it happens. Um, but the fact is, there is no objective weighing of lives in abolitionism. Therefore, there cannot be a, a procedure or a formula for deciding. As Gary says, you know, you can probably do it on psychological grounds. And that can be even more fine grained than the way he put it in Introduction to Animal Rights, which it could be. You know, whichever one is closer at hand, or something like that, or uh, uh, you know, there, it, I just want to draw out the idea that this is we have my pragmatic reasons, but there's no moral or objective. Right. Well, then that's the important thing. There's no more objective, uh, more no objective moral fact of the matter according to which it would make sense to pick one over the other. And and yet we have maybe closer emotional bonds with certain beings than with others. So. The reality is, I, I would probably pick Paula <laughs> 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 on a good day. 
But I can imagine people who might pick the dog. <coughs> and then the question is, are, they, are we in a position to morally reproach them? And the answer is, according to abolition, is no. But according to human psychology, maybe. There could be moral reasons not. I mean, there could be moral reasons that it shouldn't fly. For example, well, I'm going to pick the white person because I value white people. Or, you know, whatever. I mean, so you could, that would be wrong. I mean, I think you could flip the point. It would, all, it would also depend, you know, I mean, one of the things I talk about in the desert island is, you know, is it okay to eat an animal when there's no, there are no vegetables? And the answer is, you and I are in a desert island, and I'm starting to get an island as well as you. That wouldn't make it justifiable, but it might make it excusable. That is really wrong. But we understand that there's a compulsion that sort of mitigates the normality of the As Gary says, none of us has ever been able to be in those sorts of situations. Yeah. So, listen, so here's where we're at. Um, uh, Gary and Anna are scheduled from 11 to 11.45 with discussions on noon. So, coming up on uh, quarter after 11. Um, there's no reason we can't take an entire hour for this because we have lunch from 12 to 1 and then Sherry and Mike are up at 1. So why don't you get get together with Anna now and get ready to, to start your discussion. I don't know how to do this. And Kyle's going to help us set that up. But it's apparently pretty easy. Is that right, Kyle? Yeah. So let's just take a two-minute break. Come back and start up in a few minutes.